Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to Misinformation in Science and Society. Here to listen, not to judge. I'm your host, Annie, and today with us we have Stefan Guillenay, who is the founder and director of Red Pen Reviews. So could you please introduce yourself um, and what do you do? Sure, my name is Stefan Guillenay. Um, I am uh, trained as a biochemist and a neuroscientist, particularly in the neuroscience of obesity. And um, the thing that I do that's relevant to this podcast is I am the founder and director of an organization called Red Pen Reviews. That is a nonprofit organization that uh, publishes free expert reviews of popular health and nutrition books. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So why did you choose this career initially? Yeah. So um, I've been interested in health and nutrition for a long time. Um, it Partially, it's a personal interest. I just mm -hmm. enjoy fitness and want to be healthy like most people do. And so uh, I've read a lot of it in the interest of my own health and the health of my family. And partly it's a professional interest in the sense that I was an obesity researcher and obesity is very related to nutrition. Mm -hmm. And so in the course of um, doing this research, both the personal research that I did and the scientific research that I did, I, um, just came across, I mean, you can't help but come across so much mis misinformation in the nutrition sphere. Mm -hmm. And the more I started learning about it, the more misinformation I became aware of. Uh -huh. And um, it occurred to me that there was no way for the public to reliably distinguish between high quality and low quality information. And mm -hmm. some of the sources of information that were being perceived by the public as rigorous and reliable were in fact not, I knew because of the expertise that I had in some of those areas. And so, you know, if, if I'm, and you know, I'm, I'm seeing this in my area of expertise, but I know that there are so many areas that I'm not an expert in that I'm probably just getting totally fleeced on. And so, um, to me, like it was partly for myself too, because, um, you know, if, if I'm a scientist and maybe a little bit out of my area of expertise, I can get convinced by bad ideas for the public. It's kind of hopeless, right? Cause the average person is not an expert in most of the topics, um, of the nutrition books that they read. And yeah. so, and that's a big problem because if you have incorrect knowledge, then you're going to have incorrect behaviors and you're going to have suboptimal health outcomes. And so, you know, in this, in this country, the United States, um, 43, the, the percent of adults who have obesity is 43% currently, and two thirds of those people attempt to diet each year. And so people are interested in their health, they're interested in their weight, mm -hmm. but they're not necessarily finding the best strategies because our information environment is saturated with misinformation. And, um, and so I wanted to develop a way for the general public, a, a really easy uh, and reliable, rigorous way for the public to distinguish high quality information from low quality information. And nothing like this has, has ever been done in this sphere. Uh -huh. So what, what we did was we kind of went back to the drawing board and said, if we could design the perfect book review method, what would it be? What would it be? And I mean, step number one is just saying, let's have a method at all, right? Because most yeah. reviews you see online of nutrition books, there is no method. Mm -hmm. And so that right there is an important step to say, we're going to have a method, we're going to de define it, and we're going to apply it the same to every book. Mm -hmm. And then um, creating this structured semi-quantitative scoring system. And by semi-quantitative, what I mean is, um, so quantitative would be like, you take a ruler and you, you know, you measure something 
Um, and, you know, you, you take that specific number that the ruler says, mm -hmm. semi-quantitative is you assign numbers to something qualitative. Uh -huh. So you would say like, this claim is a little bit supported, we'll call that a one. This claim is really strongly supported, we'll call that a four. That would be semi-quantitative. So mm -hmm. we're assigning numbers to, um, to, to judgments, basically. Mm -hmm. And, and the method is administered by experts. So we're all, we all have a master's degree or higher in a relevant field of, of science. Mm -hmm. And there's a review, there's a peer review. So basically we're, you know, we can get more into the details if you want, but uh, the, the point I'm trying to make for the time being is just that we designed this method that is designed to be more rigorous and informative and unbiased than anything else that exists out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're as opposed to, you know, in contrast to the typical nutrition book review, we're actually going and checking citations and saying, is the author using these accurately? We're doing scientific literature reviews and we're saying, are they accurately representing the scientific literature in this area? Or mm -hmm. are they just cherry picking studies? Um, mm -hmm. And then we're doing healthfulness where we look at, um, you know, how healthy are these diet recommendations really? And, um, and so we have this, this method that really goes far deeper than your typical book review, even one that you might find in respected media, like New York times, the Atlantic, mm -hmm. rarely do they check even a single citation to see if the author is using them accurately. Mm -hmm. Usually the authors are not experts. And so there, basically we made this method that just like in every way possible is better than what is, than, than the current alternatives. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, so we really wanted to get back to answering your question. We really wanted to um, give the public a tool that would allow them to separate the wheat from the chaff and do so in a way that was really easy where you can land on the web page and if you just have five seconds you can just look at the top line results the numbers and the score bars and you've got great information about that book or you can go all the way you know and expand all the scoring sections and see exactly how we scored everything with citations click through citations to scientific studies and quotes and page numbers from the book so like you, if you're like a hardcore scientist, you can get everything you want. Mm -hmm. If you're a, you know, distractible internet user in five seconds, you can get what you want. So that yeah. that's kind of like what we're trying to do um, with this project. And ultimately what we want to do is more than just give the public a resource. Mm -hmm. We want to change the entire incentive structure of the publishing industry. So basically, because this is the reason that there's so much misinformation in the first place mm. is people, there's no reason not to do misinformation, right? Because like no one is, no one is critically evaluating what you're producing. So mm. why wouldn't you make, uh, you know, compelling, exaggerated claims when that is what gets you attention and book sales and supplement sales, et cetera, <laughs> fame. So we're trying to create a new incentive structure where it's transparent. And if you wanna, if you wanna publish a book that's like that, okay, but it's going to be labeled as such and people will be able to easily see it. It's mm -hmm. gonna be, it's not gonna look good for the author. It's not gonna look good for the publisher and maybe they're gonna think twice, so. Yeah. Yeah, I really like the structure, the the mission, and how it's like how you guys like executed it. Um, yeah, I think there's definitely like a lot of misinformation around like nutrition, like even just like in like families and stuff. You can like some people just like they read like an article and they're like and they send to like the family group chat. It's like, hey, I saw this. So I think yeah, it definitely applies to books as well. So I really like that. So, like, what's your favorite part of like doing what you do, like? a specific part of it? 
Um, I think my favorite part is publishing reviews. So we have a team of uh, nine people currently, and most of them are reviewers. And um, each review is a lot of work. You know, mm -hmm. this, this method, this is <laughs> part of the reason why other people don't do this is it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, but we've got really dedicated volunteers and each review takes like 40 to 100 hours to complete. And so it's a whole process. Mm -hmm. You know, they write up the review, then it's peer reviewed, then they edit it based on peer reviewed, then mm -hmm. send it to me for some light language edits. And then and then the final step of the of the um, process is I put it into the website and hit publish. And that yeah. is the most satisfying thing because it's the culmination of this huge process. And then you finally get this final product that is out in the world benefiting people. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I saw like also on your website, like that you like listed all like the mistakes or like so from your like your your the book that you wrote, um, I think that's like a great way to tackle like unintentional like misinformation. So, um, what other ways do you think will help eliminate or avoid or tackle or reduce misinformation other than like the what the stuff you're already doing and stuff? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, let me say first that I wouldn't call myself an expert on mis misinformation generally. So these are just a few thoughts off mm -hmm. the top of my head. Um, but I think, you know, when I think about the future of red pen reviews and what we can become, I think about expanding into other media classes, including, um, you know, uh, social media posts, things that are happening a lot faster that are influencing more people because mm -hmm. books are a good thing to address because they can be pretty influential. But I think most of the information people get is not coming from books. It's coming from social media or the news or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, ha like basically doing the same thing that we do, except faster and for smaller bits of media like you know tweets or mm -hmm. instagram posts or news articles or whatever it is and being able to have some kind of method that we can apply to those and get it out fast so yeah. that you know the misinformation is there and then the analysis is there you know like the next day so that you're really like hitting it at the source mm -hmm. so i think i think that's one way to do it um that's one thing that could be done, I should say. But it's tough, you know, because there are incentives to produce misinformation and there are also incentives to believe misinformation, mm. right? Like people like certain types of misinformation, mm -hmm. uh, particularly information that reinforces tribal identities. So, you know, people organize themselves into tribes, whether it's political or nutritional or religion or whatever, and they don't necessarily think critically about things that are favorable to their particular tribe. So, you know, this is just to give an example that I'm close to, like, whenever we try to uh, point out misinformation as an organization, we often get some, some pushback and, you know, some pushback can be reasonable. Like maybe we, maybe we made a mistake or, or some point we made is debatable. So, you know, I don't want to say that all pushback is unreasonable, but some of it is just like knee jerk. Like mm -hmm. you're criticizing a diet tribe that I'm in and, I don't like that. So I'm mad. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's actually been surprising to me though, how little pushback we've been getting compared to what I expected. Mm. And 
I think, and that's actually been really enlightening to me, how little pushback we've been getting. And I think, um, I think it's because it's probably for a couple of different reasons. One is that we're very polite. So we really try not to dunk on people and be snarky, mm -hmm. um, which I think is like often like, if not the primary goal, the second goal in, in like debunkings that uh -huh. you see online. Um, so we try to be really polite with people um, and give the author the benefit of the doubt. And we really, really try not to make it personal. Mm -hmm. So generally our reviews typically will only mention the review author's name once in the entire review mm -hmm. or sometimes maybe twice. And so what we're critiquing and what we continually reference is the name of the book. So we're not, we're not criticizing the author, we're criticizing or, you know, criticizing or validating, you know, whatever it might be. We're evaluating the ideas that are in the book, not the individual who wrote the book. That's the, you know, the framework. And um, I think that really helps a lot because, you know, when, once people start to feel personally attacked, then that's when the emotions start flaring up and people aren't thinking critically anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that like the way in which we write is part of it. Um, but I think also just the rigor we bring to the table, like I think people see that and they recognize that maybe they don't agree with everything we said, but they can see that we did, you know, a good faith effort to actually get to the truth and you know put out a useful product so mm -hmm. i i suspect you know I'm, i can only speculate because i don't know exactly why but i suspect that's why um and so i think those are two lessons that could be learned for other people who are trying to combat misinformation is you know, if you want to avoid it turning into a flame war, just be very professional and, and level-headed, criticize ideas, not people, and really do your homework. Mm -hmm. And you at least stand a chance at getting uh, less angry pushback. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you kind of touched on this before, but what do you think about the invention of like technology and its impact on misinformation? Yeah, I mean, it certainly helps it spread faster. I think mm -hmm. there's no question about that. Um, you know, all information spreads faster, both misinformation and non-misinformation. Um, whether, you know, I think the question really is like, is misinformation more prevalent? or more impactful today than it was like, you know, 50 years ago, a hundred years ago. And I really don't know the answer to that question. I think that is, I mean, cause if you're looking for examples of misinformation, you can find it at any, in any era of human history mm -hmm. in, in abundance. And yeah. so I think that's actually a really tough question. Um, and I think that in my opinion, that's something that you'd really have to try to research, you know, do some formal research on that to figure out whether that's true or not. Um, and I don't know if that's been done or not. You could like, you know, gather some representative sample of published materials from 50 years ago and from today and see what proportion of it is misinformation. I guess, you know, one thing you could speculate about, like, really, technology has democratized information. So like, anyone can put out whatever information they want to basically as many people as as will listen to it, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas there used to be kind of a monopoly on information mm -hmm. by kind of uh, more traditional media. Uh -huh. sources 
So I don't know. I could see that, you know, meaning that there's more inform misinformation today, but I think ultimately it's a, it's an empirical question. In other words, one that I'm not sure you could really answer by just theorizing about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, what do you think the worst type of misinformation is? Like about what? Oh man. Um, I think political misinformation is pretty darn bad. Mm. I think, are you, you're in the United States, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think what we're seeing in the United States right now in terms of political misinformation is, is very damaging and, and very threatening yeah. Um, yeah. to our, you know, functionality and, and well-being as a country and as individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that's probably the first thing that comes to mind for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that's all my questions about misinformation. So just for fun, do you have a role model? Either like professionally or just like general? Hmm. Um, let's see. A role model. No, not really. I mean, I wouldn't say I have a role model. I have, I certainly have many people who have inspired me. I guess I'll cite a few just to answer your question in a little bit of a different way. Uh -huh. um, my postdoc mentor, Mike Schwartz, he's a researcher at the University of Washington. Mm -hmm. He's, he's a great scientist. Um, I admire his work. Um, Daniel Drucker, he's a, a researcher who um, did a lot of foundational work that led to the development of these incredible new uh, weight loss drugs that we have now, like semaglutide and terzepatide. Um, I find that really inspiring. Um, my grandfather, he was just a very like strong and physically strong, but also disciplined person. Um, and I'm going to say Grandma Gatewood. She was a woman who um, hiked the Appalachian Trail a long time ago when she was in her like 70s or something. She, uh -huh. she was pretty old and she hiked the entire Appalachian Trail with nothing but a sack of like a laundry bag of stuff over her shoulder mm -hmm. and did the whole thing. And uh, I find her story pretty, pretty inspiring. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Yeah, for sure. Um, so just to close this out, do you have any advice for people, especially like teens about like anything like in general or information, nutrition, anything? Oh man. Um, yeah, I would say um, if you're at all like interested in technical subjects like STEM, I would say really learn a lot about statistics. Um, statistics is something that I didn't really appreciate the um, importance of till I was older. And by that time, I missed out on a lot of good statistics education. But statistics is just um, almost more than any other area is like really directly con connected with understanding the world we live in. Mm -hmm. um, if you understand probabilities and statistics, you're going to be just a much more functional person in today's world than, than if you don't, um, in my opinion. And um, what else? Like, yeah, like physical, develop yourself physically, get uh, really comfortable with physical activity uh, because that's going to be huge 
as you get older for your health and your function. Mm -hmm. Um, like it might not matter now, but I can tell you once you get into your twenties and thirties, you're going to see that the people who are not maintaining their bodies, they, uh, you will see changes in them and that will accelerate as everyone gets older. So take good care of your body. Um, Mm -hmm. lots of physical activity, whole natural foods and, uh, yeah yeah so uh that will be it for today thank you so much for this i like i really like the um evaluate the idea and other person not the author like the idea and like a lot of other stuff so thank you so much for this okay you're welcome annie nice speaking with you yeah you too all right bye have a great day okay bye you too